I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know any of this. Just like I said, whenever I thought this woman couldn't get any cooler, she did. She proved me wrong every single time. All right. <sighs> Hello, beautiful people. It's me again. I'm back. I apologize for my absence. Um, I do promise you, this is my vow to you and me, that I will eventually get to a point where I no longer have to make apologies for my absence. Uh, what can I say? She's been going down. She's been going down. She's all right. She's in therapy. She's medicated. She's doing a lot better, you guys. And we're gonna get it together eventually. I so, 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 so appreciate you guys sticking around and hanging out with me and being patient with me. It means so much. Thank you. I love you. I love you so much. I love you. Today's video is going to be another makeup and history. If you're new here, Makeup and History is a series on my channel where we talk about something from the past, a scandal, a person, you know, whatevs. My last two uploads, we talked about Ronald Reagan, the Reagan administration, and OJ Simpson. Um, they were for real downers. Made me really upset doing the research for those videos. So for this one, I wanted to do something a little bit more positive, uplifting. Today, we're going to be talking about the life of Josephine Baker. Mwah. I love her so much. I love her so much, you guys. It's, oh, I love you. Love you, Josephine. When I was researching for this video, I felt so inspired. I felt like I'm not actually living life. You know, I'm merely existing. Josephine Baker lived a life. You hear me? It's just, it's unimaginable, honestly. Like she had a very full, wonderful life. So if you've not heard of it, buckle on in, baby. Before we jump into the story, I do have a sponsor for this video, Case the if you're watching videos on YouTube, then I probably don't have to tell you what Casetify is. But if you don't know, it's a phone case company. It's a really cool phone case company. You can customize your phone case. So they are primarily known for their phone cases. So many different options, so many different cool customized settings that you can do for your phone, but also for other devices. Right now, Casetify is really working on becoming a more sustainable brand. They're eliminating virgin and single use plastic products. The new impact and ultra impact cases are made of 65% plant-based or recycled materials, which is crazy. And all of their packaging comes in recycled materials. It's important to note that they're making all of these sustainable changes without compromising the quality of their product. They still make amazing phone cases. So this is the package that I got from Casetify. I customized two of them and then I got the other two from the designs that they have on the site. This is my favorite one that I customized. I don't know if you guys can see it in the camera, but it says don't talk to me. So the other one I got customized with my initials in this really pretty color. And then these two were the options that they had just on the site. It's free callow, some crushed candy. I don't, I don't actually know what the hell this one is, but it looks really cool and that's what matters. That's what matters. It also matters that the phone case actually protects your phone. Case Defy has increased the drop protection on their phone. So previously it was 6.6 .6 feet. You can drop your phone from 6.6 .6 feet and nothing would happen. And now you can drop your phone from nine 9.8 feet, nearly 10 feet, and nothing will happen. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know your life. I don't know what you got going on, but you can chuck your phone 10 feet away from you. No props. Caseify also makes their cases with a feature they call Defensify, which is an antimicrobial coating on the case. It kills 99.999% of the bacteria on the case. <laughs> Some of the bacteria is going to live, but hey. What are you gonna do? They also guarantee their cases are made of non-toxic, non-hazardous products. So that's also important. A lot of important things happening. So if you haven't tried Caseify yet and you would like to, click the link in my description box. There's also a coupon code. I'll put a coupon code on the screen so you can save 15% off your first purchase. I'm gonna stop myself because I made a mistake here. You don't get 15% off of your first purchase. You get 15% off of your purchase forever. Using the link in my description box, you'll get 15% off anytime you shop at Case Defy until they shut it down. Case Defy is also a really great gift option, you know? Everybody has a phone, so everyone needs a phone case. Am I wrong? <laughs> okay, you guys, I'm sorry. I'm in a really silly, goofy mood, but shout out to Case Defy. Thank you for sponsoring this video. 
I just haven't filmed in a long time, so this is like, it's not like riding a bike. Like, I really need to get used to this again. Click the link in the description box to check out Case Five. Okay, if you're still watching and you would like to, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Subscribe. Turn on the notification bell so you're notified every time I upload. Like, comment, engage, don't be fake. All right, you guys, let's put on some makeup and get into this story. All of the products that I'm gonna be using on my face will be listed down in the description box, as well as where I get my information from. I always cite my sources if you're curious. I also welcome fact checking, you know? If I get something wrong, let me know down in the comments below. But don't be a bitch, okay? <laughs> Don't be rude. So today we're gonna to be talking about the legend, Josephine Baker. You guys, I always knew she was an icon, but I didn't, I didn't really know, you know? I did find out though. The stuff that I've researched about her life is the stuff that's public. Can you imagine like what, what we don't know? Ugh. So to start this story, we need to get in our time machine and go back in time. You know the drill. In case you missed my last video, the time machine got an upgrade, so. All right, so June 3rd, 1906, Josephine Baker was born Frida Josephine McDonald in St. Louis, Missouri. Josephine was born in a hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, and historians think this is weird because she was biracial, her mom was black, and at that time, most of the country was still very, very segregated, very racist, and most people were really poor, so like, they were still giving birth at home. So to be admitted into the hospital as a black woman in 1906, it wasn't normal. Now, the tea is Josephine's mother, Carrie McDonald, was a housekeeper. She worked as a housekeeper for a wealthy German family. And by German, I mean white. They were white, in case anyone didn't know, whatever. Her mother worked as a housekeeper for a very wealthy German family. And the rumor around town was that she was impregnated by her employer. We can't confirm or deny. However, historians think that's the reason her mother was admitted into a hospital and she was allowed to stay there. because Someone was funding her stay. Someone, someone like pull some strings. So Josephine never finds out who her biological father is, but shortly after she's born, her mother gets into a relationship with a man named Eddie Carson. And this is who Josephine considers to be her dad. She might've known he wasn't her real dad, but she considered him to be a dad. So Eddie worked as a drummer. He was an entertainer in the Vaudeville era. And he and Josephine's mother would go throughout the Midwest performing. He was a drummer, she was a dancer, and they would also bring Josephine with them. And she became really good at entertaining from a very young age. She was like three years old, and as soon as those lights hit her, she's like, mm, this is it. This is it. This is me. <laughs> I love that. I love early self-actualization. I love it. So her parents were entertainers and touring throughout the Midwest for a little while, and then her mom got sick of it. She was like, listen, Eddie, we're not making any money. Like, this is getting old. It's not going anywhere, so we should just give up. And Eddie's like, no, and so he bounces. He's like, you don't believe in my dreams? I'm gonna follow my dreams by myself. And so he leaves, he abandons them. After Josephine's dad leaves, Carrie, her mom, is like, okay, I gotta move on, and she does. She finds a new man, a man named Arthur Martin, and together they have three more children. Josephine would make four, they had four children. Now, Arthur was, Arthur was a really kind man. You know, not the kind of man who would ever just desert his family. However, he couldn't keep a job. One of the articles I read said that he was perpetually unemployed. Because Arthur didn't work or couldn't keep a job, their family was very, very poor, extremely poor. Josephine says a lot of times she went hungry or she would go out into the neighborhood and try and, you know, dig through the trash for food. She would perform. She would still do like street performances for change to try and get food. Um, they were very, very poor. All right, so when Josephine is around the age of nine, her mother's like, listen, Hun, you gotta start pulling your weight around here. You need to get a job. You're nine now and we need money because Arthur can't keep a job, so you need to get a job. And she does. Josephine gets a job babysitting for wealthy white families, watching their young children, doing laundry, cleaning, you know, just kind of like a housekeeper, like a nine-year-old housekeeper slash nanny. And she says this was a very terrible experience. Like they were not kind to her at all. They would say things to her like, make sure you don't kiss the baby because she was black. Uh, one lady burned her hands because she put too much detergent when she was washing the clothes so she burned her hands like why are people so rude why somebody tell me why by this point josephine had grown pretty accustomed to being treated poorly for being black she'd witnessed a lot of racially motivated violence in her community so basically josephine had a really rough childhood 
It was not great. But she says that the circumstances of her life when she was a child made her really street smart. She had to grow up really fast and learn really fast, and she did. And she also continued dancing and performing because that was like a sense of joy, like that brought her a lot of joy just to dance on the street, get a couple coins, you know? Cause that's what they did back then, they threw coins. Like, ouch, what if you hit someone with one of those coins? Don't hit me with no quarter, sir. Thank you, but thank you. Thank you kindly. <laughs> All right, so in 1919, at the age of 12, Josephine decides she's done with the square life. She's going to stop going to school. Not that she was going that much anyway, but she was done with school. She was gonna run away and pursue her career as a full-time entertainer. She wanted to dance specifically. Her mom was of course very upset by this news because she was a dancer and she's like, Josephine, look how that turned out for me. Why would you wanna be a dancer? Why, Josephine? But Josephine didn't care. She didn't listen to her mother and she ran away. At the age of 12, Josephine ran away to follow her dreams and she actually gets picked up by a group called the Jones Family Band and she begins touring with them, dancing and doing comedic skits all over the country. And she loved it. And people love her. She very quickly became a fan favorite. So in between tours, in order to earn extra money, Josephine gets a job as a waitress at this place called the Old Chauffeur's Club. She's working at the Old Chauffeur's Club and she meets a man named Willie Wells and they hit it off and they decide to get married. Josephine was 13 at the time. She had her first husband at 13, folks. One, three. Full on child bride, but different times, I guess. I don't, I don't, I was not there. I don't know. Now, there wasn't a lot of information on Willie Wells. I couldn't really find much about him. I did find that he worked on trains, and that's really it. According to Josephine, they had a very unhappy marriage, and they got married in 1920, and then they divorced in 1920. In 1921, at the age of 15, Josephine meets another man by the name of William Baker, and they decide to get married. So just to clarify, she's 15 years old on her second husband. <laughs> Catch up. The girl's gotta catch up. One thing that historians noted about Josephine was that she was not afraid to leave a marriage. A lot of women, especially back then in the 20s, they didn't leave marriages for security or safety or what have you. But even at the age of 13, she was like, this isn't working out for me. I gotta go. I love that for her. Okay, so she's now married to William Baker and this is where her last name Baker comes from. So she dropped Frida and just started going by her stage name, Josephine Baker. So Josephine and her new husband had a better marriage than her first one. She liked him a lot. However, she was still really focused on her career. She still really wanted to be a dancer and that was her priority. Her mother still greatly disapproved and she would tell her all the time like, Josephine, you need to pay more attention to your husband. What are you still doing trying to do this dance thing, Josephine. She probably called her Frida. Frida, what are you still doing this dancing thing for? Give it up. Be a better wife. I don't know. I don't want to seem like I'm mocking her mother. That's not, that's not okay either. So there was a lot of tension between Josephine and her mother about her career. Um, but Josephine never let that deter her. She did not care. She was like, I'm a star. This is what I was born to do. And it's your fault, actually. You made me dance when I was a baby. At the age of 16, Josephine decides she wants to join this group called the Dixie Steppers. And she auditions, but they turn her away because she was too dark. This wasn't an uncommon thing, especially back then. A lot of people of color had to pass what was known as the brown paper bag test. So if you, like a, like, you know, the brown paper school lunch bag. If you weren't lighter than that bag, then you couldn't join certain organizations certain fraternities, sororities, and apparently the Dixie Steppers. It's a very racist, stupid beauty standard that a lot of people still live by, unfortunately. It's preposterous, it's ridiculous, guys. What are we doing? What are we doing? Josephine didn't let any of this deter her. She decided to bleach her skin to make herself lighter, and then she re-auditioned, and this time she was accepted. She became one of the Dixie Steppers, and very quickly she became the most popular one. People would show up just to see her. In 1923, Josephine was asked to go with the group to New York to perform on Broadway. So Josephine, of course, tells her mom and her husband about the great news. She's going to New York. She's going to be a star. And her mom's pissed. She's like, really, Josephine? Really? You're just going to leave your husband, Josephine? And Josephine's like, yeah, mom, I am. I'll see y'all, y'all be easy. So she leaves to New York and she and William decide to split up, but she does keep his last name though. She remains 
Josephine Baker. By 1925, just two years after moving to New York, Josephine Baker becomes the highest paid chorus girl in the entire city. Black or white, she was making the most money. The average salary for chorus girls during that time, white chorus girls, was $16 a week. Josephine was making $125 a week, okay? She was a wealthy woman. Even though she had all of this success and fame now, she was still not allowed to go certain places. She couldn't spend her money certain places because she was black. And she felt really ashamed about the fact that she would never get to have the full experience of being American because she because of her skin color. She believed that her career in America had reached its height, and she'd heard that in France, they were more accepting of black people. So in 1925, she decided to move to Paris. She packs up her stuff. She heads across the Atlantic Ocean to France, baby. All right, so now that we're in France, I can guarantee I'm going to pronounce everything incorrectly, and I'm really hoping we can move past it, okay? Apologies in advance. To the people of France. So after arriving in Paris, Josephine starts performing at the Théâtre des Champs. <laughs> oh, that was pathetic. Okay, let's try it again. The Théâtre des Champs Élysées. I definitely will have that on the screen so you guys know what I was trying to say, but that's where she gets a job performing. She joins a show called the La Revue Negre. The show features all black performers and at first, the French public was like, what, what is this? Why is she a light? They preferred to watch black performers that were darker, which is crazy because she literally had to lighten her skin in America in order to be successful. But in France, they preferred to watch I don't, people are weird. So the French audiences didn't immediately love that Josephine was a lighter complexioned black person. Um, they also didn't love her style of dancing. Uh, firstly, she performed pretty much naked, which is great. Her style of dancing was very uninhibited. It was comical, but it was also sexy. And they'd never seen that before. Like no one had ever mixed sexy, funny. Like she wasn't afraid to make fun of herself, which they thought was just odd. It was just odd. To them. They were used to entertainers who wanted to be glamorous. And Josephine was glamorous, but she also wasn't afraid to make fun of herself. This is how it always goes, you guys. I'm like fumbling with my eye makeup right now. Anyone who does makeup, I know you have a favorite eye. Like I have a, this is my favorite eye. This eye always just comes out perfect exactly how I want it to. And this eye just won't get with the goddamn program. All right, we're gonna pop on some lashes and just ignore it. We're gonna do our very best to just ignore it. It's fine, it is fine. All right, lashes are on, we proceed. So the general audience in France, mostly white people, weren't a huge fan of Josephine early on. However, the forward-thinking like artists amongst the society were obsessed with her. Apparently, Pablo Picasso wanted to paint her. He went and saw her and he immediately wanted to paint her legs. He said she had legs of paradise. I don't know, like you guys, I honestly, when I read this, I thought Pablo Picasso was alive like way before the 1920s. I did not think Pablo Picasso was alive and well in the 30s, but like, what do I know? So the artists loved her and eventually the rest of the population got on board and she became a huge hit. Again, everywhere she goes, she's a hit. She became most famous for her banana dance. She wore this banana skirt and the theme was kind of like African monkeys. It was very racist, but she loved it. The audience loved it. It was a hit. In 1927, Josephine meets a man by the name of Giuseppe Pepito Abantino. People just called him Pepito. And Pepito sees Josephine perform and he is enamored. He's like you know, everyone else. He's in a trance. She's the best thing he's ever seen, right? So he immediately says, I want to be your manager. <laughs> and he goes up to Josephine and she, he's like, listen, I am a part of the Italian aristocracy. My family is royalty there and I know business really well and I want to be your manager. And Josephine's like, Okay, sure. Turns out he wasn't actually a part of the aristocracy. He wasn't a member of royalty. He was actually a gigolo, which for those of you who don't know, it's a male lady of the night. 
It's not really clear when Josephine finds out that he lied about everything, um, but she still trusted him to run the business. She was never really good at business, but she knew that was something that needed to be handled, so she was like, okay, and she trusts this guy. Now that Pepito was officially the manager, he tells Josephine, look, I don't think Paris is where it's at anymore. Like, your show's getting old here. People are getting used to it. We need to take you around the continent. That's right, a tour around Europe. All the cities, we're hitting all the cities. And Josephine's like, okay, cool, that sounds great. By this point, she was already pretty famous, like not like super famous, but she was well known enough that they could go and do shows in other cities in Europe. So they started the tour in Europe and they saw success in some cities. However, this was the rise of the Nazi regime. And if I'm not mistaken, they were Puritans. They were prudes, if you will. They did not want the debauchery that was Josephine Baker's boobies bouncing across the stage, right? Like they were, they were like, mm -hmm, cover up, whatever. The Nazis, they were boring. They were boring, plain and simple. <laughs> so some of the countries that were already influenced by the Nazi regime didn't allow Josephine to even come into the country. It wasn't a ton of countries that didn't let her in. It was just a few. Overall, the tour was successful and she was happy that she did it. While they were out on tour, she and her manager, Pepito, fall in love and they start doing it, right? He's head over heels in love with her. They're in Austria, I think, and a Hungarian officer saw Josephine and he was like, I want you. And Pepito's like, hell no, bro, this is me. And the Hungarian officers were like, okay, let's duel then. Let's have a fucking duel over Josephine. And that's what they did. They fucking dueled, you guys. Josephine had two men fighting with swords for her love. She's the one who had to end the duel. After Pepito got stabbed, she was like, okay, all right, all right, you guys, it's all right. So she and Pepito go back to France. So Pepito and Josephine returned back to France in 1931. And this was the year France was celebrating something they called the Colonial Exposition, where they basically had like a exhibit of their conquests in other countries, like showing the French people, like, look what we got when we were in Africa. Very problematic, very upsetting. However, for Josephine, this was the perfect opportunity to perform. She incorporated a lot of African things into her performances. So this was the perfect time to perform to an audience that was, you know, her niche and to take it up a notch. Before now, Josephine had only been a dancer. She was a silent act. A lot of facial expressions, a lot of movements, boobies, all of that. Now she wanted to sing and she wanted to perform her voice as well. The Colonial Exposition was the perfect time to do it. So Josephine performs the song Ja Ja T I'm sorry. Ja du amour, which translates to my two loves. And of course it's a hit because everything is with Josephine, goddess. The performance went so well and people loved her rendition of this song so much that it became kind of like her theme song. Some historians believe the reason she sung the song was because it was about like having two loves and not really fitting in in either world and they thought this meant she was talking about America and France, living in France, but Later, they were like, maybe she was talking about the fact that she was bisexual and she had two loves for men and women. But of course, that wasn't like, that wasn't a thing people wanted to talk about then, let alone, you know, be open about. So they thought it was about the countries, but it could have been about the fact that she liked the lady. She, she took a dip in the lady pond. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> Sorry. Apparently Josephine had many female lovers. One of them allegedly being Frida Kahlo, right? Can you imagine? Frida Kahlo and Josephine Baker, getting it on. Love it, I love it. Isn't history great? Like, ugh, I love it. <laughs> Josephine was a very progressive woman, like even for today's standards. Um, but back then she exuded confidence and love and people just wanted to be around her men and women because josephine was becoming so popular she began using her celebrity status for activism in 1934 she famously performed a song called zoo zoo the song was about 
the French colonization of Haiti and how cruel they were being to the people in Haiti. But French people were just listening to that song and her voice and they weren't even like listening to the fact that she was talking shit. They were just like, oh my God, do it encore, do it again. But she really believed in equality and especially coming from America where she was treated like a second class citizen. She stood up for that in the world anywhere she saw it and any way that she could, which is huge. In 1936, Josephine returned back to the US to perform and this was the first time that she'd been back since she left 10 years prior. She was shocked to find out that literally nothing had changed. Even though she was an international superstar at this point, she was still treated terribly in America. The venues where she was being asked to perform were requiring her to come in through the back entrance. Like, y'all asked me to be here and I can't come through the front door? Child. Anyway, the hotel that Josephine was staying at in New York City, she had a horrible incident where she was walking out of the hotel and a white woman passed her by as they were, she was walking out and the white woman was walking in and the woman spit on her. She literally spit on her. What is wrong with y'all? Why are y'all like this? What the why? Josephine says that this incident made her cry, but not because the woman was horrible, a horrible fucking person, but because the woman had been taught to hate. She didn't know any difference. And she really hated that that was still the environment in America. When she was in France and everything was not great, but much better, she wasn't getting spit on outside of a hotel. Like, excuse you? Josephine couldn't wait to get back to France, and after she finished all of her commitments, she got on the first boat back. Get me the f out of here, crazy people. When she finally made it back to France, they welcomed her with a parade, like people were there cheering her on. She was like, this is my home now. I'm not going back. I ain't, why would I go back? For what? In 1937, Josephine officially became a French citizen. So she was not kidding. She was not looking back. That was her home now. They loved her there. They accepted her. She knew the language now. She had friends. She was hanging out with Pablo Picasso. Why would she go back to America so she can get spit on at a hotel by some random? Ugh, we're gonna put this hair up because she's getting hot. All right, so now it's 1939 and things are getting crazy over in Europe. Hitler's gone full psycho. He's wildin'. It's World War II. Germany was already occupying multiple countries in Europe and France was kind of just like anxiously waiting their turn. Like, they're like, all right guys, get ready. They're coming. You know? So everyone's on edge just waiting for the Nazis to arrive, especially the military. And Josephine, now as a French citizen, she wants to do her part. You know, she wants to help the troops, support the troops. So in an effort to support the troops, Josephine did what she did best. She entertained. She would put on shows for the military to boost morale. She held fundraising events, raising over $4 million for the French military. Like she was ride or die. Uh-uh, not up in here, Germany. Like that is so, I think that's so incredible because she didn't have to do that. Coco Chanel is also in Paris, like who God knows what, like waiting for the Nazis to arrive because she wants to hang out. You know, not all famous successful people with all the time and money to actually help really want to help. And Josephine wanted to help. That's cool. That's cool be a good person. So in the year 1940, Germany officially declares war in France and you know, they knew it was coming. It was just a matter of time. So Josephine leaves Paris to avoid the war, but she's not done. She still wants to help the military. You know, she's a French citizen to the death. I don't know if it was that serious, but I like to think so. Because Josephine was a very high profile celebrity, she was still invited to a lot of the parties and events um, where a lot of the Nazis were hanging out. Coco Chanel was there being a traitor to her nation. But rather than actually going to the parties like as a guest, Josephine was going to these events and working as a spy. She was gathering any intel that she heard them saying or talking about and then going and reporting it back to the French military. So effectively, she was a spy. She was a spy. Like I can't, she just gets cooler and cooler to me. She's the coolest person that ever existed. The information that Josephine gathered and reported back to the generals of the French army was so helpful that after the war had ended, she received honors for her contributions. My girl was saving the world. Josephine Baker was saving the world while Coco Chanel was cozying up with the Nazis. The reason I keep saying Coco Chanel's name so much is because I did a video about her biography, about how she was basically a Nazi. Allegedly. If you guys would like to see that video, I will link it down in the description box. I, don't, I haven't worn this much makeup in a minute. It looks great, but is it not great? Let me know. 
be honest. All right, so now we're gonna fast forward a couple years to 1947. Josephine is 41 now, and she decides that she really wants to have a family. She always dreamed of adopting a bunch of kids from around the world and having them all live together in one community to prove that skin tone didn't matter because it never did. But that was a dream of hers, and now that she had enough money to do so, she bought a bunch of land in the south of France, this really big chateau, and she adopted 12 kids from all over the world, and they like grew up there. That is so cool. That's my dream. She called them the Rainbow Tribe, and they all lived there and grew up, and it was chill, you know, just like she thought it would be. While raising her Rainbow Tribe, Josephine is now on her fourth husband. We skipped the third husband because there wasn't much to say. Um, I do think her marrying him was the reason she became a citizen in France, but it didn't last, so. You know, what are you gonna do? Her fourth husband was a man named Joe Bullion, and Joe was who the children considered to be their father. Um, it was also Josephine's longest lasting relationship. They were together for 14 years. Josephine continued performing while raising her children, but she made her family the main priority, um, and she was very selective about where she chose to perform. So she did go back to the US, but she refused to perform for segregated audiences, and this helped push like racism out of the entertainment industry a lot sooner. In 1956, at the age of 50, she announced that she was retiring. She was done with the with the life. She was no longer performing. She really just wanted to dedicate her life to her children. Even though Josephine was no longer performing, she did continue her activism. Um, in 1963, she went back to the US and she was the only woman to give a speech at the March on Washington. Josephine Baker was the only woman at the event who gave a speech and afterward, Martin Luther King wrote her this letter thanking her and praising her for bringing so much attention to it. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know any of this. Just like I said, whenever I thought this woman couldn't get any cooler, she did. She proved me wrong every single time. All right, you guys, we're almost done. Almost done, I'm almost done with the makeup. So in 1969, our girl Josephine, she runs into some trouble. She runs out of money. She and Joe broke up, they divorced, and he was the one who primarily handled the money stuff. Like I said earlier, she was never good with money. So she was about to lose her house. She had all these kids. She's like, well, I need to make some money. So she decides to start performing again. So Josephine plans what she called the comeback tour, and it was a world tour where she went all around the world, doing her thing, killing it, still selling out, you know? Everybody still wanted to see the girl. And she realized that she still really loved performing. The younger artists who were now working with her said that she was so gracious, she was very motivating. Um, she didn't make them feel inferior, which was something that a lot of like larger acts do. They don't want, you know, they don't want anyone stealing their shine. They usually don't like the younger, hotter version of themselves, right? But not Josephine, she was like, it's all love. I want everybody to be great because she was cool. In 1975, Josephine performed her last show. She performed in Paris for the 50th anniversary of her debut there. So of course it was a hit. Everybody was trying to get in there. And at this point, she's 70 years old. She's still dancing in like nude-ish type attire, killing it, getting standing ovations at 70 years old. So after her 50th anniversary performance in Paris, Josephine sadly passed away in her sleep. They think it was due to a brain aneurysm. They found her in her hotel room the next day and she was laying there asleep, they thought, but she was surrounded by love notes and congratulations and flowers from all of her fans. So she, she fell asleep reading notes from her fans about how much they loved her and in, how much she inspired them and inspired the world. Like, and then she died. She even died in a cool way, you guys. Am I the only one like freaking out about like how I don't understand how someone can be so cool. She was an angel. A goddamn angel. All right, you guys, that is it for this video. I apologize in advance if it was a little all over the place. Um, I was in a very silly, goofy mood and I haven't filmed in a long time. So I'm just trying to like, you know, get back into the groove of it. Bear with me. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this topic. I would love to know what you guys' thoughts are down in the comments below. I talk about a lot of dirt bags in this series and it was really refreshing to talk about like a genuinely good person, you know? I'm sure she wasn't all good, you know, none of us are, but overall she was a great, person, a good human being. It really inspired me to do more, live more, 
You know, that's what we should all be doing. Making better choices, being better people, like our goddess Josephine Baker. Bless. All right, you guys, that's it for me. Please be sure to leave a comment below and just say hey or let me know what you thought of this video. Did you learn something? What do you want me to talk about next, huh? If you haven't already, please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Also, check out some of my other videos. Hang out. Don't be fake. I love you. I love you very much. I'll see you next time. Okay? Bye.